I serve as a lay pastor at Covenant Life Church in Tampa. We've been in Tampa about three years, and my, my wife, uh, Christina, is here with my three daughters, Phoenix, Flora, and Aurora. And uh, something about Covenant Life, our church, our heart is to spread the gospel. Probably just as your heart is the same here at Legacy. And one way we believe in spreading the gospel is through the thriving and spreading of healthy churches. And so we desire to plant new churches. And, and our church, we have, a, we have several members who commute right now from St. Petersburg over and would love to see a church planted somewhere in St. Pete. And so we're hopeful that this fall, that Lord willing, uh, that we would be sent out to plant a church uh, here in Pinellas County and so that the gospel might spread. And so Pastor Drew has been such a help to me, an encouragement to me, as he's helped me to get to know the city and uh, even this opportunity to preach and open the word for you today. So we've already been blessed by Legacy Church so much, so it's an honor to be here this morning and um, a joy to open up the word of God with you this morning. To start out, I want us to take a moment and reflect. And this is not a happy thing to meditate on. But I want you to imagine what it would be like to have nothing. Not just lack of material wealth. Imagine that you have no resources at all. No support systems. Nothing to depend on. Not even the benefit and love of the people in this room. Not yourself, not your own skills or abilities. You don't have anyone to call. And even if you did, you don't have a phone to make the call with. Nothing to be confident in. Nothing to trust in. No assurance of your survival. As I was contemplating what this would be like, as I was meditating upon this, I couldn't help but think of the terrors of war and Ukrainian refugees running from their homes. Maybe only holding their children in their hands amidst chaos. Not sure where to go to refuge or, or for their next meal. What despair it must be to have everything stripped from you. With no assurance. With all your security gone. And for some of you, this may be all too easy to imagine. What it would be like to have very little, to have nothing, no support. But for many in our American context, Try as we might. This is hard for us truly to imagine. We have such ample resources, so many things and people and systems to rely upon. Many of us have backup plan after backup plan. And we are blessed to have so many of our basic needs filled. In Psalm 62 that we'll be looking at this morning, David didn't have to imagine himself in this situation. He was in it. He had nothing to rely on except God. And my goal in preaching this morning is the same as David's in writing this psalm. I aim to break your trust and confidence in anything that this world has to offer. And I aim to build your trust and confidence in the only thing supremely worthy of it. Our great God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, You are so good to us, God. We live lives of abundance and, and we recognize it far too little. Um, God, thank You for the provision that we have in You. Lord, help us this morning uh, to break our trust of lesser things that we are so prone to put our hopes in. And, and build our confidence in you, God. Prepare our hearts to hear your word. And may we leave here with a greater affection, a greater love, and a greater trust and confidence in you alone. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Join me this morning by turning in your Bibles to Psalm 62. It'll be helpful as we go through. I'll kind of say the verses, and you can just kind of follow along as we move through the passage. The surrounding context of King David's situation in this psalm is not immediately clear. But one thing we know for sure that is that he is in distress. He could be on the run from his vengeful father-in-law, Saul, who is trying to kill him. 
Or he can be on the run from his son Absalom who has usurped him, tried to take his throne, and wants him dead. But either way, can you imagine living a life full of such dire situations that, that people would have difficulty placing uh, which terrible event it was in your life? David has been through a lot. And when we put it side by side, his suffering with our suffering, it can give us a greater perspective of just how bad suffering can be. It could make us thankful for the graces that we have been given. And through David's response to his suffering, we can share in the same hope and the same confidence that he had. In the flow and structure of Psalm 62, David begins with a humble confidence, and this will eventually grow more boldly into an overflowing confidence. And then lastly, in the summation of our psalm, we'll see the validation, the reasons for this confidence that David holds. And this confidence that David held is for all Christians to take hold of. And for that reason, the three points in our sermon will be our humble confidence, our overflowing confidence, and the reasons for our confidence. And so let's first take a look at this humble confidence that David holds, our humble confidence, in verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> the psalm begins abruptly with David jumping in and just telling us how he really feels. It's as if anxiousness is starting to creep over him, and he stops it in its tracks and he says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. David is preaching to himself. He is having a self-pep talk, reminding himself of what he knows to be true about God. David has looked around at his own condition. He's taken an inventory of everything he has, all his resources, everything that he can rely upon. I mean, even, even if David had a place to turn, where could he go? Maybe his family? His family, they are the ones trying to kill him. Maybe he could go to the local authorities. Many of the authorities want him dead too. But in this place of bleakness, he is determined where his real trust is found. Nothing else but God is to be trusted. David's soul waits in silence. But this is not a passive waiting. It does not exclude human action or activity. But it is a trusting expectation, a trusting hope knowing that God will deliver on His promises. He's entrusting with everything, and it's as though His problems are no longer His own. He's going to the submission of God's goodness and sovereignty, even amidst His troubles. And by, by worldly logic, waiting on the Lord can almost seem counterintuitive, right? We need to roll up our sleeves. We need to grab the bull by the horns. We need to get in there and try something. We don't like to not be in control. It can be so easy to turn to our resources or our loved ones instead of God, but waiting on God is a trademark of the Christian life. It is what we do. We are able to say with generations of Christians before us, His time is the best time, and therefore we wait and trust in Him knowing that it will be accomplished as He sees fit. Listen to what Isaiah 64.4 has to say about our waiting for God and how He acts on behalf of His people. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for Him. If we are in Christ, we can boldly submit our lives to His will. From our perspective, we may think that we are forgotten, that, we are, are, that He has moved on and that, that our, we are not seen, but He acts on our behalf. And we can have full assurance that waiting on the Lord is never a lost cause. God is acting. And through active, patient, trusting seeking and praying, we can learn to wait on Him. David goes on to speak of the provision that he is finding in God. And he lists three things. He alone is my rock, my salvation, and my fortress. A rock 
would provide a solid foundation. It's where we want to build our house, right? It would offer protection from enemies. A rock in the desert would be a welcome site because it would provide shade and shelter. Similarly, a fortress would provide protection from enemies. It's a place of sure strong, it's a sure stronghold, a place that is safe. And then he calls God his salvation. Because not only is he the one with the ability to help him in his present circumstances, he is also the one that David is placing his faith in for the eternal salvation of his soul. Trusting in the promises of God. Looking forward to the coming Messiah. The provision David was looking forward to, we look back in history as we put our hope in the Gospel. The sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus. Atoning for our sins and showering us with mercy as we are transformed and made new creations in Christ. This is the salvation that David was looking forward to. David is strengthening himself with truths about who God is. And as a result, he is able to say, I shall not be greatly shaken. He is expectant of God's deliverance. When you think about the day-to-day of your life, and in your speech that, that comes from our mouths, are you more prone to speak expectantly about what you will do, or about what God will do? We can get caught up in the hype, the tangible things that we see right in front of us. But many times in the Christian life, faithfulness can seem so ordinary and plain. It's not, very fla- it's not always very flashy, but God is accomplishing His purposes. I was helped by a pastor who, after preaching a sermon, told me that he was hopeful for what that sermon might do. Not that week for his congregation, but months and years ahead, how it might affect the hearts of his people. Christians should be an expectant people. We should, we should be expectantly hopeful. We know that the Lord goes before us in all things. Deuteronomy 31.8 The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. David, in this terrible place, in in a valley of his life, says, from him comes my salvation. In this terrible place, yet his heart is expectant upon God. When we do sacrificial acts, when we speak truth to each other, when we pray for others, when we share the Gospel, when we gather as saints, We can have a hopeful expectation because of the God we serve. His purposes never get canceled or take a day off. And after grounding himself in the attributes of God, David then shifts to the attributes of sinful humanity in verses 3 and 4. He says, How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence, They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. David has endured attack after attack, attempts on his life, and he asks his attackers, how long will you persecute me? How long will you keep this up? These evil men are plotting to kill him in the picture that is meant to be conveyed by this image of of this is, is like a poorly built wall or a, a terribly constructed fence that would crash down on you at any moment. They are pressing in on him. They are looming over him. And a disaster could strike at any moment. They not only lie, but they take pleasure in what is false. They are two-faced, blessing others in public, but cursing them when in private. And with all this evil around him, David is able to have resolute confidence in God. No anxious fear, no impatient wondering how long God will allow this to continue. He waits in silence for God to deliver him. Facing the hardest circumstances of your life, where might you be prone to turn? 
as we contemplate this question, where, where we would turn in these hard circumstances, um, what I'm about to tell you, it may be surprising. This may be uh, counter, it's definitely countercultural, but, but hear me out. Give me a chance on it. Uh, the, this position that David has been put in of soul reliance on God, this is a gift. This is a grace to him. If you have ever been brought low, where your only reliance, your only hope and trust is in God, and you cannot turn anywhere else, this is a grace. As hard as we may try, as many books as we may read, we cannot get to this place with sole reliance on human effort and wisdom. This is the grace of God teaching us to trust in Him alone. God wants us in this place. It's best for us to be in this place. We can, when we can say, I don't have a plan, I don't have a strategy to implement, I, when we can say, I don't have an answer for this, but I have you. And that is enough. It is a grace to be in this place that David is in. He is seeing reality in this place as it truly is upheld by, completely by the Lord. Everything. And in spite of his affliction, we've seen David is able to have this humble confidence in God. But it doesn't just stop there. As he reflects more on the security and the provision he has in God, this humble confidence grows into an overflowing confidence. In verses 5-8. through eight, Our overflowing confidence. Starting in verse 5, we see this resounding refrain of the psalm. If you look, it's very similar to verse 1. David waits in silence for God alone. But if you look at the two verses, instead of saying his soul is waiting in verse 1, like in verse 1, he is now telling his soul to wait. Oh, my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He is commanding his soul to wait for God alone. David repeats himself again and again. Why is he doing this? I don't know about you, but sometimes when reading the Bible, I'm tempted to believe that the heroes of the faith are almost superhuman, right? That they don't share the same struggles and sin, sin struggles and, and you know, obstacles and nervousness, anxiety that we do. But this is not the case. In this Christian life, we will never outgrow our dependence of, on God. There's no such thing as a Christian who reaches perfect composure. We will always need to be reminded of the truth. We need to remind ourselves daily. We need to be disciplining ourselves for the purpose of godliness. We need to be in the Word, in prayer, seeking Him. And we need the encouragement of our brothers and sisters. As a tea bag steeps in a pot of water, and it is changed, that substance is changed over time. So do we grow in our confidence in the Lord as we absorb truth day after day. David repeats truth to himself, and he takes hold of the power and security that he has in God, and this confidence grows. And instead of his thoughts turning to his enemies and his problems like it did in the first stanza, in his growing confidence, David is completely wrapped up in the beauty of God. In the goodness of God. It's as if the problems don't exist anymore. Verses 6 and 7, he lists again that in God he finds his rock, his salvation and refuge. And instead of saying, I will not be greatly shaken, this time he says, I will not be shaken. In the first stanza, he can be shaken some. Right? Just not greatly, but in this refrain, refrain, this overflowing confidence, as he reminds himself the truth, he refuses to be shaken at all. And as this confidence wells up inside of him, the infinite provision and protection he has in God, he can't help but come out of him. And he moves from telling himself and he turns to the people in verse 8. And he tells them, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. This exhortation is not just for the people of David's day. This is for people of all times, in all places. God is 
worthy of a universal confidence. And when we learn about God, when we attend Bible studies and we're, we are sitting under God's Word, the truth is not meant to just end with us. We're not sponges that absorb it with never, never giving it out. As we grow in our confidence, we are then able to commend it to others. And to my, my non-Christian friends here today, we want to commend to you the object of our trust. We would love to talk with you about our great God and the trust and the refuge that we have found in Him. I would just ask you, as, as you hear the message today, and you think about and evaluate what you have trust in, where are you finding your refuge in your salvation? We are all finding refuge in something. Every single one of us. It's the object of that refuge that's important. And if you found yourself in a similar situation as David, how would your refuge hold up? It's so easy to, to cling to our idols and have things when times are good, right? But what would happen if you were in David's situation? These things were no longer what we had our security in. In a world with so many unreliable and constantly changing places to put our trust, we would argue that God is the only sure and constant refuge. In this time of trouble, David was able to see God's goodness in greater ways. And he wants us to have the same confidence and trust that he does. He then tells us to pour out our hearts before God. To go to God in prayer. We can share our troubles with him. And he hears the cries of our hearts. We read in Psalm 34, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. It saves the crushed in spirit. Some of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we keep our troubles stored up. We, we hide them until they drive us to despair. We need to bring these worries and anxieties of our hearts before the Lord. As we run to God, just like David, we get swept up in Him and our problems fade. After exhorting the people with the overflowing confidence in God alone, David gives us the reasons for his confidence. The reasons for our confidence in verses 9 through 12. <clears throat> and he validates this claim by first pointing out why everything outside of God is not to be trusted, and lastly, why God is to be trusted at all times. Verse 9 Those of low estate are but a breath, those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Both people of high and low estate, from kings and queens to common men, all are, among, all are coming after David. David would not only be in fear of what men might do to him, he would also be tempted to trust in these different factions of men. From the people of prominence to the everyday man, we read that they don't matter. He says that those of low estate are but a breath, a vapor that is gone in seconds like dandelion fluff. And to those that are high ranking in society that were so easily able to attribute prominence, he says that they are a delusion, a lie. Some translations say vanity. For all their social status, they are empty and unsubstantial. And this is not commenting on their character, saying all powerful people are, are deceitful. But the, the power they wield is a deception. It is unreliable, and we cannot depend upon it. And the picture that is conveyed in verse 9, with them going up in the balances, is that that's them being measured on God's divine scales. And together, both the common men and the prominent alike on one side with all their ability and their resources and skill, are all together lighter than a breath when weighed against the infinite provision found in God. Not even the same weight of, as a breath, but less, but lighter than a breath. All men, regardless of social status, 
are woefully inadequate objects of trust. With all the kings and queens of the earth, the masses of common people at our disposal, none of them can save one soul from death. None of them can free us from the consequences of sin. It is God and God alone who can do this. And after showing that our hope is not to be placed in humanity, David moves to show us the folly of trusting in our things, our possessions, our riches. And while the main focus of verse 10 is on material wealth, this can be replaced with anything that we are prone to trust uh, more than God in our hearts. Verse 10, he says, Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. We, if we're not careful, we can think that there's something to be gained by dishonest means. Right? Uh, it can be a temptation to think, if I gain the system, if I cheat this one time to get wealthy, it will be worth it. From the point of view from those in positions of power, if I hope to accomplish my objective by using and taking advantage of others, this is sinful and wrong. Conquerors, tyrants, the owners of slaves, they have all put their trust in extorting others for their own gains. How could people do these things? It is because they have placed their trust in extortion and robbery. And not only are they cheating others, they are cheating themselves. Because these things will never satisfy. And like that poorly constructed wall or that messed up fence, they may look good at first glance, but they will collapse in on themselves. And knowing our temptation to build up our own kingdoms, it is not just the dishonest means that should concern us. We should be concerned about placing our trust in the honest means as well. As we start to make money, we can think about our trajectory in life and our security in life and, and build up our little nest egg. It can easily become our refuge. Psalm 52 equates this with our own destruction. See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. It is hard, if we're honest with ourselves, it is hard to have riches and not to trust them. I don't know what that's like, but I think it's hard. Yeah. Um, and as they increase, we must be careful not to set our hearts upon them. Financial security, real estate, oil, money, gold, stocks, crypto, insurance policies, whatever investment we put our trust in, these are short-lived securities. They can disappear as quickly as they appeared. And trusting in these things will be of no value in your salvation. They may be good things in our lives, but if they are ever taking the place of God, they are a delusion. They are a vain hope. And we are fed these false hopes in every stage of our lives. These God replacements in every stage. We can put our trust in relationships, in friendships. Putting our hope in the refuge of marriage. On the flip side, we can find our refuge in our singleness, our own self-sufficiency, our own autonomy. Maybe your degree or your future job has become your salt after refuge. Maybe your trust in your youth, your ability, your beauty, what others think of you. Financial stability, your earning potential. Maybe once that side project takes off, that will be your refuge. Once you get that dream home, that will be your refuge. Trust in health care. Trust in insurance. In retirement. Trust and hope in the government. Trust and hope that the government would end. Trust in the strength of your nation. Parents, maybe your refuge is found in the hopes of your children. In all your efforts, we cannot even secure the salvation of our own children. By His grace, God has not left us to live with our trust in lesser things that will never truly satisfy if we are in Christ, He has smashed our trust in these idols so that the ultimate good and right object of our faith would be Him. And in our last two verses, we see three attributes of God 
that put on full display why he is our sole hope and salvation. In verse 11, when David says, once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, this repetition is meant to designate importance. It is a declaration putting a special emphasis on the following statement as extremely important. That power belongs to God. The all-sufficient strength that man is lacking is found in God. And in thinking about God's power in preparation for this sermon, I was drawn to Isaiah 40. And I want to read a few selected verses from this chapter that show the power of God. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? God in his might, in the hollow of his hands, is measuring the oceans of the earth. Like we would mark off end zones in a football field, he is marking off the heavens. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. In comparison to God's mighty power, all the strengths of the nations are a drop in a bucket. He's over them all. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of this earth as emptiness. He upholds this earth, and humanity is as, as grasshoppers before him. We're little bugs hopping to and fro, worried about the, the anxieties of our day. He stretches out the heaven like a blanket for us to dwell in. All the mightiest who ever lived are as emptiness when compared to his might. I would encourage you, go and read Isaiah 40 in its entirety this week and dwell on the power of God. Some small things we can do to bring these truths before us. Next time you're at the beach, take a moment. to You see the beautiful ocean in front of you to dwell on the God who measures the oceans in the palms of his hand. Next time you're laying out a towel or blanket or making a pallet on the floor, reflect on God who stretches the heavens out like a curtain, who lays out all creation for us to dwell in. If God... We're just all-powerful. If it ended there, that doesn't mean that He would be worthy of our trust. Yes, He would be mighty, but we would not be able to trust in His promises, per se. How might He wield that power? He could be all-powerful and evil, for all we know. He would be worthy of our fear, but He would not be worthy of our trust. Not a God that our soul waits in silence for. David goes on in verse 12, not only emphasizing the power of God, but that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. Praise God that He is as merciful as He is mighty. Setting our mind on God, we serve who is all-powerful and all-loving, equips us to stand through the greatest trials of our life and to be, overcome any temptation and to say with David, for God alone, O oh, my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from Him. He is my only rock, my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Christians, how can we live in fear when the one who holds all destinies has set His affections upon us? Nowhere is this perfect power and love put on greater display than at the cross. God, who created, sustains, and upholds the universe by His infinite power. The King of kings, who is from the highest estate possible, but unlike men, His high standing is no delusion. In all this power, He humbled Himself, took on flesh, and came to earth as a man. And this was not so he could sit on earthly thrones or build fortresses here on earth. 
He perfectly waited on the Lord. He had confidence in his Father's plans, even if it meant a cruel death on a cross. Everyone who has walked this earth has sinned against the Almighty and is deserving of His wrath, except one. And in His sinless perfection, He would die so that His people would be saved. Those who turn from their sins and place their faith in Him receive mercy. Compelled by steadfast love, He died for His people and accomplished their salvation. In His infinite power, He did not stay dead, but rose again, showing that He should be the supreme object of our trust and confidence. For hundreds and hundreds of years, generations of believers waited on the Lord for the fulfillment of this coming Messiah that would one day crush the head of the serpent. And they poured out their hearts to God. They sought their refuge in Him. And we can wait and trust today because that outcome has already been secured. Christians Christians can have confidence like no other. No matter what life throws at us, we are secure in Christ. We have in Him overflowing confidence. Not in ourselves. Not in our things. Not in our efforts. But in Him. And in His perfect love and power. One more reason for our confidence. We are assured in the closing verse that He is just. For you will render to a man according to his work. We may not always see it, but God is a God of justice. And He will put an end to the wicked and expose them in their plots. And He is always vigilant in protecting and defending His own children. He sees David's afflictions just as He sees ours. And in the end, justice will be had. We see in Ecclesiastes 12, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The question we are left with is do we want to be judged for our own works or for Jesus' work? On that day of judgment, whose righteousness will we stand on? With His infinite power, in His loyal, faithful covenant love, as divine judge, He will judge the world accordingly. And it is for this reason that we can wait upon the Lord. If everything was taken from us, and we still had God, we would have everything that we could ever need. He is sufficient. He is our salvation, our fortress, our hope, and our refuge. Pour out your hearts before Him. Remind yourself daily of His goodness and exhort others to do the same. Wait upon the Lord and trust Him in Him entirely. He alone is worthy of our confidence. Let us wait for Him in silence. Let's pray. Dear God, even in these words, it is hard to express Your glory. God, thank you that you love us so perfectly and in all power and in all humility you provided Christ so that we would not have to trust in our own imperfect righteousness, but we would stand uh, covered in the blood of Christ, covered uh, by this provision. And and Lord, I just pray that this week as we go from this place, Lord, that you would grow our trust in you and that you would be our soul confidence, that we have confidence in you alone. In your name we pray, amen.